Hello everyone. Welcome to FS Change Makers. And as usual, we have an amazing woman who's joining us today uh, and share about her journey. Uh, we were getting feedback from some of you that there was being an overdose of uh, women from the corporate world. So we are going a bit artistic today. Uh, we have Nidhi Mariam Jacob joining us. Uh, Nidhi is an artist, uh, a teacher and an earth lover as per her Instagram profile. Uh, but I think it'll be better for her to talk in detail about her journey and herself. Uh, Nidhi, thanks so much for joining us. You're most welcome, Adarsh. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Nidhi, so why don't you share uh, more about yourself and you know what all you've been uh, doing uh, with our audience today? Yeah. So my name is Nidhi. I'm based in Bangalore. I'm an artist and an art teacher and a muralist as well. Um, uh, most of my art is kind of uh, my interpretation uh, of uh, my love for nature and the natural world. So you could say I'm a botanical artist, but I don't like to like, you know, slot myself into anything. But yeah, botanical art is mainly what I do. And my style is uh, um, more of it's like a fantasy. Most of my uh, paintings are like a fantasy series of fantasy gardens where um, I strive to kind of paint more than what my eyes can see and kind of uh, paint what my mind and heart see as well and imagine. So I've been painting for since I was really young, since I was four or five, as long as I can remember. Um, but I've gone through the process of doing so many different things over my life. I'm 43 uh, now and now, you know, my work is getting seen and, you know, it's like I've got a second chance at life. So I've done all these things. And I think at this point, I'm kind of okay and finally settled in to say that you know yes I am an artist for now at least so yeah so that's about my work and uh, yeah. Nidhi so I think uh, in the last few years you've seen quite a, a big transformation even in your personal life as well uh, would you like to share yes. some more details about that yeah so much has happened over this 43 years of uh, life you know um, and I feel like the big change as you asked me was uh, a huge transformation that happened for me about six years ago. Um, uh, I was married for, uh, I knew my uh, ex-husband for 25 years. We were high school sweethearts um, and uh, we, uh, we were seeing each other for a long time. Then we were married and we had a, uh, I have a son, biological son. And six years ago, uh, we adopted a little girl and I feel her name is Midori. And I feel like uh, when Midori came home, you know, I was just going through life, like just getting along and, you know, making things work and you know how it is, right? You have your family, you're trying to do uh, right by everything. Um, but when Midori came home and I started spending time with her, of course, my son was a learning in itself, but with her being a little girl and, you know, uh, so looking at me like this, like goddess almost, she'd look at me and be like, oh my God, you're so great, you know? And she was three and a half, she wasn't a baby. She was almost four when she came home to me, to us. Uh, so, you know, spending time with her, I realized that, um, oh my God, I cannot just keep going as I'm going, you know? I need to look at myself and be a better woman, to be a stronger woman, to give her an example that the amount of power and uh, 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 the capacity of, of, of what women can do, you know? And um, I wanted to be able to show her that I can stand up for myself. So in my marriage, it was a good marriage. I had a great, we had a great many years and stuff like that, but you know, there was disrespect because of the amount of time we had spent together. And there was like, you know, and I was just like covering up for stuff and making things look okay. But then once she came into my life, I said, I need to teach her that everything is not okay you know we have to, I need to show her I need to teach her so I feel like she brought me uh, to that point where I said something in my life needs to change you know because you know uh, um, so I had conversations with some people with friends with my husband and um, I felt like you know my concept of, an, of a relationship of equality of being in an equal marriage of being in an equal relationship my financial status my work so many things were just not in sync with who I really was I had so much more to give you know um, so then uh, I wanted to express myself through my work so then I came up with this project called breathing canvas this is while I was married 
and uh, it was to paint on bodies and stuff like that, which I will tell you about later in detail. But when I said, this is the project I want to do, I remember my ex-husband said, what is this? Like, it's such a self-indulgent thing you want to do. And then I said, oh my God, where is the boy that I, uh, you know, I met uh, 25 years ago uh, that thinks that I'm doing this. So I said, you know, I have so much more to give. So it started off like that. And uh, then I, of course, I went ahead and did it because I felt like I needed to express myself in some way in terms of intimacy and so many things. And uh, so my relationship with my husband started, started, you know, moving apart. It was really sad. It was a very sad phase. It was difficult. It was a struggle because my daughter had just come home. You know, she had just come into this home, into this family. So I did receive a lot of criticism. Things, I mean, right now my life looks so... That's why we're talking because my life looks so great, right? But the struggle was intense. And um, so through Breathing Canvas, I met my present partner, Bhavna. I call her B. So I will uh, refer to her as B. And she is this young woman who's eight years older, uh, younger than me, uh, who I met. And then uh, because I was so caught up in my own world for so long, the outside world seemed so far away in so many ways. And then I meet this woman who is fiercely independent, right? Who has such strong values and ideals about life and what women should be and the belief in herself. And I feel at some point, the friendship there turned into something more. And I was like, what is happening to me? What is going on here, right? Um, and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know who to talk to about this, right? Um, um, and then the funny thing is I spoke to my mother at one point and I said, you know, mom, you know that I've not been happy in my marriage. And she said that I know, I know for a long time, but you just, <laughs> you know, never said anything. But these days you seem to be smiling a lot, you know, <laughs> look really happy. So I said, you know, I've met this person. I don't know what it is. Uh, and uh, it's a woman and she ma makes me feel like I want to make some kind of change in my life. I don't know what it is but I want to change. And then my mother, of course, was like, oh my God, what's happening to my family? We are going to be destroyed and stuff like that. And so she went through that for a while, my folks, but they were so amazing because the next day she called me and said, listen, I know that you're happy right now and there's something happening for you. And my family is conservative, okay? It's not like, you know, they're like liberal people or anything, but she said, whatever makes you happy. If you think that you don't want to be in this marriage anymore, it's fine. We are here for you. We will support you whatever it is, forget about this person you've met and all that, because that might not last, but whatever it's doing for you now, you know, it's good. And we are here for you. So I did go through the separation and uh, it was very sad, but the kids took it, the kids took it as well as they could take it. I just felt like at that point, I just stopped giving the power to everyone around me. And I kind of took my power back into my own hands. And then slowly my life took off as an individual. And I feel like even though my children went through so much, I feel like now if you if we talk about it, I feel like they are proud of me, even though they'll never say it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah. So, so that so you mentioned that, that your mother, uh, you know, uh, first by the shock and then, of course, took it pretty well. How was the reaction yeah. of other people around you? Because this was a big change, right? Um, especially yeah. that late in your life. Uh, yes. Right. So, how was everyone uh, around you, your friends and the rest of the family, etc.? Yeah. So, it was a huge transformation. My life kind of like flipped 360 degrees with everything, you no, know, with love, with the children, with my whole family, my friend circle. My, my ex husband and I had common friends. So, it was really difficult uh, in terms of like changing from that one lane to the next, you know. So, I had a lot. So, um, like I said, like it was, it was a struggle, but at some point I knew that I was doing this honestly. I wasn't doing it out of viciousness or anything. I was doing it honestly. And I just wanted to, I'd found some truth for myself. So I just plunged into it. I said, okay, if my family is going to desert me and if my friends are not going to talk, I can't force anyone to love me. You know, I can't force my friends and say, listen, you know me for so long. How can you think that what I'm doing is wrong, right? This is my truth. When I'm going through a change, everyone around me is going through that change as well. So you can't expect everyone to go, like, go with the flow. So I just kind of 
uh, allowed that to happen. I said, let me let go of everything and not kind of force everyone to be okay with this. And I feel like really, you know, Adarsh, time tells all because I made those changes. It was not difficult because financially also I was not okay, which I'll tell you about. That's like a whole uh, different thing. And, and it was, it's so beautiful right now. It's been five years uh, since my separation and everything. But all my friends are coming back because they can see that uh, I'm doing things honestly. And, you know, my, my uh, uh, cousins and everybody call me now. And they're like, my God, you're doing so great. We're so proud of you with all the work you're doing and, you know, everything. So I feel like um, I just had to get out of that state of uh, victimhood, you know, that a lot of women, we put ourselves through that. Oh, I was abused when I was a child. Oh, my husband didn't treat me well. Oh, my friends don't understand me. Oh, my parents didn't do this for me. You know, we're in that constant state of things. So I had to say, I need to stop feeling like a victim and kind of give and like stop blaming, stop accept, expecting. And you know, things are slowly getting better. My family and friends, they're all here with me, you know, so I haven't lost anybody, even though I was ready to lose everyone. And my kids are doing good. So yeah, I feel like I needed to make that change. I needed to act, you know. So yeah, so that's what I did. And um, thankfully, I'm grateful that uh, things have gone. Kudos to you well. for acting and kudos to everyone for, you know, accepting the change uh, as they should. Thank you. Uh, so uh, you, you spoke about financial, uh, being financially dependent on your husband and, you know, how, yeah. uh, and obviously it was a big change in your life. So how did you cope with it? And, you know, how did you end up becoming this financially independent artist that you are today? Wow, it sounds so good to say that. <laughs> uh, well, I wasn't, uh, I wouldn't say completely financially uh, uh, dependent on my ex-husband, in a, but I understand how it comes across like that. But I feel like the role of mothers is, uh, there's a fine line between what we do and uh, what we achieve and what is expected of us. So the thing is, I was always painting. I was always doing art. I was always doing uh, projects and stuff and the money that came in I would probably buy furniture for the house or I would buy cycles for the kids or I'd buy books for them or toys or whatever and that is just an unaccounted part of uh, the expense you know so it's I did contribute but I didn't contribute every month half for rent half for school half for so I feel like uh, in that way there was it just didn't feel like an equal partnership you know um, uh, so when this happened and because I initiated my uh, separation I told the kids father I said okay you only pay for uh, school fees for the kids and I'll take care of everything else okay because I was like I wanted the separation and then once it was agreed upon I was like oh my god now what am I going to do right <laughs> how am I going to play, pay rent how am I going to like feed the kids and I have animals and stuff I have a little farm uh, which my which is uh, which belongs to my mother where we have six dogs and two cows and goats and uh, you know a family of five who live there who we have to pay salaries to and of course like I help at home and I said how am I going to do this and at that point I uh, Bhavna was in my life and I, I asked her once I said you know uh, B will you help me with this and she's like no I'm not going to help you you can do this you know she said I will take care of myself you take care of yourself and your children and that's how we are in an equal relationship and there is respect and love of the relationship in that way so then at that point I had to just pull everything I had from inside and say you know uh, what are my strengths what can I do I know I'm an artist and painter but how far can I go with this to make a living and provide be the provider for my family right so um, I did everything I could I started teaching children I started taking art classes and uh, slowly that my classes got better and more children started coming to me and you know that's how my rent got paid and then I started making paintings continuously and um, you know uh, I must say in my case uh, like uh, my saying is behind every successful woman there's <laughs> there's an, another strong successful woman <laughs> because uh, B has been so encouraging even though she said she's not going to help me she has helped me in ways I cannot explain because she's enabled me to do the work you know she's really helped with the kids and she would sit with them through school um, and help them with their homework and she's a theater actor herself so she also would be out doing you know her rehearsals and stuff but she would make it home for dinner but yeah so she was always there to you know 
help me, like actively help me. Anything I did, she'll say, my God, this is so good. You should put it out. Why are you hiding your work? Don't hide your work. Put it on social media. So honestly, my Instagram and all is just like a few years old. I never used to put out work. So now that encouragement has been so great that everything I do, I put it, you know, I put it out there and then I get appreciation and I'm like, wow, you know, my work is worth it. So, and then I started selling my work and the classes and um, I basically started believing in myself, you know, and I, I started being confident of what my capabilities are. And I feel like it, from there, it just flowed, it just flowed. And I'm so proud to say now that I support six dogs and two cows and 40 chicken and <laughs> my children and my three cats and, you know, my home. And uh, it's not like I'm making millions or anything like that. But, uh, but on an everyday, I feel so good that I am where I am. And my work comes with so much, uh, you know, joy. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's, that's my journey with my financial thing. And also, I want to say, I feel like I was I started becoming more aware of saving, living within my means, you know, and not overspending. I think it's so important that we do that. I don't have a credit card. So I live, I really live within my means. I don't overspend um, because I know, I know what it takes, right? Like I have to make sure that monthly I'm paying six people or whatever. Uh, I've never borrowed. So I, I feel I've never borrowed money. I'm not taking a loan and I'm doing it slowly and steadily. And yeah, so I think it was just about understanding my capabilities and just working on that. So I'm yeah. Sharing that. I think uh, at some level, every a young person needs to understand the importance of saving and financial management. I think a lot of us don't do that, uh, you know, yeah. sometimes because of the comfort of our families, uh, sometimes yeah. we're just careless, but all of us need to know this. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that is uh, true. let's talk about your art, right? Because that at some level uh, is a very, very crucial part of your life. Uh, how yeah. did you, uh, so uh, how was art for you as, uh, you know, while you were growing up? But at some level, did you always know that you are going to be an artist? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know. I don't think so. Even though I drew and painted since I was very young, uh, my family, so my dad's side of the family, they're all academics and professors and doctors and everything like that and my mother's side of the family are all business people so it's all money 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 <laughs> and so I was kind of seen as like oh she's an artist oh she's going to become a hippie <laughs> you know like <laughs> I mean there was no disrespect but I could feel that there was no uh, I, I, I wasn't recognized there as wasn't much you know she disrespect but there wasn't respect either either it was kind of like there or oh, she was not going to amount to anything what artists like my mother would say oh you know my daughter I was hoping that she'll be a doctor and uh, be wielding a stethoscope and surgical knife and all but she's wielding a, a paintbrush <laughs> you know it should embarrass me in situations and stuff like that but uh, what I must say is even though that was there I feel like I learned so many lessons from that and the beautiful things that came from my family uh, in terms of art and stuff. So, you know, I do botanical art, I draw nature and flowers and trees and stuff. So the little things like most of my art is kind of like a memory from my childhood in so many ways. Like the little things that I remember are my, the, uh, my grandfather, he loved nature, he loved plants and stuff like that. So when I was very little, two or three years old, the things I remember about my relationship with him uh, apart from him saying, oh, she's not going to make money, was that he would take me for walks every evening, every time we went to Chennai for my summer, for the summer, you know, and I would wait for every evening because he'd carry me and take me out for a walk and we would pluck little flowers and put it into a basket from the neighbor's uh, uh, fences and stuff like that. And, you know, it was so inspiring and memories of going on a train to Kerala and the champa sellers selling, you know, champaka flowers in the baskets. And I still use all those things when I paint now. So, I mean, there was something from my childhood that I still hold on to. And uh, yeah, I use those memories a lot for my work. But no, I didn't, I, I didn't know or think that I would be an artist, but it was there, I think, inside me. You know that you use elements, you use elements from your childhood uh, when you paint. Uh, but yeah. how, do you, how does your regular life or uh, you know play a role in your art right do you take inspiration from a lot of things which happened to you as a person 
Yes, of course. I feel like any any artist, any artist, and you know, writers and musicians, I think we all derive our work is work comes from our life in some way. Like you might see, I, you've seen my. I don't know if you've seen my paintings or others, but you might look at it and say, "Oh, it's pretty, it's nice." But every piece of work comes from something, you know. Like my breathing canvas, the project came from my. Uh, wanting to understand intimacy in a different way because my relationship with my mother was difficult in many ways, my relationship, my relationships. Then I have um, a series that I do called Pods and Buds uh, in watercolor. So that was from last year during the lockdown uh, when, you know, people were suffering. I mean, even now, yes, but, uh, you know, I would watch, uh, uh, you know, flowers die and then buds rebloom. And that whole concept of death and rebirth is what uh, uh, started me off on the pods and bud series. So yes, there's a lot, like I think everything from life comes into my work as an artist, for sure. For I think sure. You, yeah. you mentioned the breathing canvas, quite, uh, you know, uh, a, a few times. Uh, yeah. So I think that is also, yeah. you know, something which is very unique in the way uh, that you've been doing, which is, you know, the whole idea of painting on human bodies. How did that idea yes. came into being? Would love to hear the genesis yeah. and how the entire experience has been. Yeah, uh, so Breathing Canvas is an ongoing project. I started it, uh, like I said, four years ago, uh, 2016. Um, and the whole idea was it started off as, you know, oh, I'm, I'm painting on paper and canvas all the time. I want to do something different. It started off as kind of like an experiment, you know, an experiment to paint on a different canvas. Like, And so I, I started saying, you know, what if I start painting on the human body, on skin? It's like living, it's moving. That's how Breathing Canvas came about. Um, that's how it started as, uh, you know, an art project, but I feel like slowly as it went on, uh, it just became a lot more than just an art project. You know, I remember telling a friend, Smriti, I said, you know, I want to do this thing. I want to paint on bodies. I want to archive and I want to do a photo series. She said, why, what are you doing it for? Like, what is the reason? So I said, I don't know, but I need to do this. There's something here, right? Um, and she said, yeah, yeah, do it. You start tomorrow. And I remember I started the next day, I got one subject. And I got a venue and I started painting. We got beautiful pictures. I, this project is in collaboration with a, a beautiful photographer, Padmalata Ravi, who takes my photographs for me. I do the body art and she does the thing. So what happened was, as I went from one subject to the other, I started feeling like there's so much more to the work. You know, It wasn't just a photo series of body art. Because as I kept painting on different... So in, I started with women. Of course, I painted women... Uh, for the project um, we started it started became, becoming like what do I say I wanted it suddenly came to a point where I wanted to highlight the fact that the sensitivity that what is personal is political in some way in terms of body image in terms of conditioning in terms of what we see our bodies as with social media and everyone looking so perfectly beautiful and you know so I picked I picked uh, women, like I picked a dancer, I picked an actor, I picked a mother, I picked different kinds of women of different sizes and different colors. And I asked them, and of course they, they were so kind to trust me enough to do this because it's, it's pretty out there, you know, it's pretty bold. I didn't use models or actors, I used regular everyday women, you know. Um, and then the, pro, the uh, uh, while going through it, like I, uh, there was one mother who, when I called her and I said, uh, Ramita, would you like to do it? I don't know who, uh, remember the name, but she said, I don't know. I'll go to the gym and then you call me in one month and then uh, you paint on me. I said, no, 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 that's not the point of this. You know, I want to paint on you as you are. And as we painted that day, like she started off kind of like low like that. And then as I kept painting on her and she just became so proud. And, and then at some point she's looking in the mirror and she said, my God, I really like my belly. It's beautiful. And I said, yes, you know, so there's so much openness and we shared, I mean, uh, like it was just about losing, there's so much ego that we have as human beings, you know, about beauty and things like that. So a lot of that came out. We shared stories about so many things came out about women saying, as you know, as looked at, looked, so, looked down upon because I was dark or because you know, I had stretch marks or because my hair was so frizzy and all these things that we go through as children and we kind of carry it with us till adulthood, men and women, it's not just women. So, you know, I feel like our bodies store all these memories and 
uh, stories from our life. So all those things started coming out and it kind of became like a, a tapestry of everyone's consciousness, you know? And then uh, the whole process was day long. Like I'd paint for five, six hours, I'd be painting. Um, I would kind of use the arcs, the, you know, the contours of the body to kind of lead me to do the painting. So they were very simple lines, dots and things like that. And we would wash it off after photographing them, you know? So the whole impermanence of that work, it was so beautiful to, it just gave me that opportunity to understand impermanence and fragility of my, of that work, piece of work, just like life is, you know, there is impermanence, nothing lasts forever. I mean, if you think that this, this day is going to be the same forever, it's not. If you're extremely sad or depressed, tomorrow might not be the same. Or if you're extremely happy, tomorrow might be hard. So I feel like this project kind of, uh, it really taught me so much about impermanence, my practice as an artist and um, uh, so many things. So yeah, it's, it, it's, it's one of my most favorite projects and it's taught me so much about life and yeah. So, so I think that's breathing. So from moving from one project to the other. So I think you've also uh, done a series on orgasm flowers and you know, yes. would love to know more about that and how you normalized it. So uh, this uh, this was a personal project. I did it for, um, I haven't shown the work anywhere or anything. I just like post it on social media and stuff. But it came about one night when I was just sitting on my bed after a long day. And I just pulled out a little book and I just wrote down, you know, my sensations when I uh, experience an orgasm. It just came out of nowhere. And then I started painting a flower with that description. And then what was most fascinating for me was the kind of flower that I drew for myself based on the writing, right? It, it came from my imagination. It came from those words. So it was almost like poetry, like giving color and shapes to words, you know? Um, so, and the process of having these words in my head while I painted these flowers, you know? So then I said, wow, this is so beautiful. I did one, I showed it to my partner. I said, you write something now and uh, give it to me. Let me paint you a flower. And um, I started doing that. And then she said, this is so beautiful. Why don't you ask other people to write to you? So I said, I don't know. Will people write to me? So I just put it out. I said, if anyone would like a flower, please write to me, uh, you know, what you experience during an orgasm and I will paint you a flower and send it to you. And that was about it. Then people started writing in, okay. <laughs> Like, oh my God, I was getting writings and writings and poems and poems. And every day I was like, oh my God, now I have to paint flowers for each How one of these. How many did you end up painting? I painted about 30, I think, but I've got many more writings and I have to get to it like slowly. I keep, so I'll do one, I'll send it to the person and hope they like it because it's their writing. Uh, so it was so beautiful. So the, the beauty of the project was, I wasn't trying to make a statement. It is about orgasms. But uh, it wasn't even about making a statement. It was just to show the purity of what we experience with anything, right? Like, uh, I feel like um, talking about an orgasm, talking about sex, periods, everything, like men, with men and women, and uh, a, a lot in India and all over the world, is kind of taboo. It's like, oh my God, how can I tell you about my orgasm? But it is just part of our existence. It's how we feel. It's so pure and uh, beautiful. So I feel like it just happened naturally and we have like a whole series of work uh, based on that and it, that's how it became normal. Like, you know, people just wrote in, some men wrote in and said, uh, um, are you doing this only for women because they are flowers? So then I said, you know, there's male and female flowers, there's male and female animals, there's male and female uh, 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 human beings, there's male and female of everything. So why not a, a flower for a man? So then men started writing it. It was so amazing, you know? And the openness that came from that was really like satisfying for me and the people who wrote it, I hope. No, so now that we've uh, spoken about orgasms, I think we are now at the fag end of our <laughs> discussion as well. <laughs> Yeah, good one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so yeah. as we typically end all our discussion, uh, all our discussions, I'll ask you, you know, four quick questions. Uh, and okay. without thinking a lot, I want you to give me answers, uh, which come sure. immediately to you, right? Uh, yes. So uh, this is our rapid fire question. Uh, let's start oh. with, uh, who are the three Indian women who inspire you the most? 
silence. <laughs> there's so many, there's so many uh, in India and all over the world. Um, but I would say I would like to, there's so many people to uh, admire and love, uh, women to admire and love in our country. But I think because Bangalore is my home and uh, I, I love Bangalore and I have so many strong, amazing women around me. Maybe I'll talk about three uh, women from Bangalore who make a difference in people's lives and who made a huge impact on my life as well. Uh, so I think one would be uh, uh, Smriti Gargi Ishwar. She's an artist and she's known for her series of goddesses that she makes. She's a graphic artist and they call the Sister Misfortune series. She's an amazingly talented artist and her research on her work and how she lives her life and her, her views on the world and everything are so inspiring. So she's one person and she's kind of been there for me like a rock uh, through so much, so much that I've gone through. So she's one woman, you should check out her work. It's really amazing. And um, the second would be uh, Mariam Bey, who is a, a wellness coach in Bangalore and uh, uh, almost like a life coach. Uh, I've known her and she's we've been Bangaloreans all our life, but I've just met her again kind of formally and we've started to become friends and stuff. Um, uh, she is a really, she has a really inspiring life story from her childhood to right now. And I feel like she's one of the most non-judgmental health coaches or life coaches I've, I've ever known, you know. She's like, she gives you, I feel like she's a gentle teacher. She'll gently push you to live a better life. She'll gently push you to eat better and to live better without being judgmental and say oh how can you eat this or how can you do that and she over the last uh, one year I would say has really inspired me to do better and be better so she is one person and she she okay uh, and the third would be this one woman Nisha Abdullah in Bangalore who is a theater maker and writer and all her work over the years I'm such a big fan of hers I'm so, I, I have so many women to talk about, actually. I'm like a super fan of like so many women I know because they're so amazing. But uh, Nisha Abdullah, is uh, uh, she makes theater for children with very relevant issues, um, you know, about bullying, about growing up, of the difficulty of uh, uh, growing up, about disparities in caste and uh, creed and um, all those things. So she makes plays about that. And presently, she does so much work. She relentlessly is working to help people in uh, local neighborhoods and giving them food and supplying them kits because, you know, they don't have work and stuff. And she's just like a champion for, you know, fighting in the face of injustice. She's constantly educating people about it. Like she doesn't stop. And sometimes I wonder, does she not get tired because she's constantly educating and telling you this is the right way to do it, uh, you know. Um, and so her, I mean, she is one woman, Nisha Abdullah, who I really, really admire. All like these heroes in Bangalore, there are so many unsung heroes in like animal welfare and human rights and writers and poets. There's so many. I wish I could tell them, to tell, give you all their names. But yeah, these three for now. <laughs> that, that's an amazing list. So moving on to the second one. Uh, having spoken about the women who inspire you, what is that one moment from your own life that inspires you or defines you or makes you the person that you are? Um, the one moment. I feel like maybe uh, adopting my daughter and bringing her home would be one moment that really, really changed things for me big time. Yeah, I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. Uh, the third one is eventually we are in a parent brand so we have to talk about clothes at some stage uh, what are the five uh, wardrobe staples that you need to have at all times um i'm not much of like a fashionable person as such i like really simple styles and i like to be clean and neat and um, uh, all those things and i like dressing up and things like that but there's not um, i'm not into like present fashion as such but I like, I like my clothes and everything. I really like a lot of white right now because my kids have grown up and I know they will not be throwing chocolate cake at me uh, or uh, like, you know, vomiting mango milkshake. So I do wear a lot of white now. <laughs> uh, so I have white shirt, white dress, white pants, which I could never think about wearing before. So I love whites. I do a lot of white and I like watches, even though I don't have too many, but I have three or four that I really treasure. Uh, so a watch is like a big essential for me with anything I wear and I love them so much that my dad 
uh, a year ago actually uh, messaged me and said uh, you know mole i'm in my will i'm going to write all my watches to you <laughs> so that's how much i like watches and of course like footwear i like kolapuris i like sneakers a lot because it keeps makes me feel active yeah and yeah so that's that's about it i hope that okay. helps i think we covered five cool uh, yeah. so the last one before we end it any message that you want to give to our audience today um i'm talking for myself as an artist and all the artists out there i mean actually anyone in any profession it's so hard it's like you know it's it's really heartbreaking what is happening in our country and all over the world but of course in india right now we're going through a really tough time losing loved ones and people are getting ill and stuff like that uh, i'm really grateful that i have some work during this time which i didn't think i would because i paint and i thought nobody will give me anything to do but i have some work and i'm happy about that but i feel like artists whether you're a sculptor or a painter or a writer or a musician or you or a dancer or a theater maker you know artists are such sensitive beings and our levels of empathy are so high that we are so prone to depression and feeling sad and feeling guilty and saying what is the point of my work like we see all the news and it happens to me as well where i look at the news and i'm like oh my god my work really is of no point you know so i think my message would be that we have to keep creating because as artists our work matters uh, in any way what you're writing what you're painting what you're uh, um, uh, singing you know the music you're making i feel like it's all we are all recording the history of our times and also kind of recording our dreams for a better future so i feel like as artists it's important to keep doing it and don't stop you know even though we feel guilt like we could say you know instead of doing this i could be helping out i could be doing something which we should we should help maybe donate to a uh, donate to an organization that's helping out in your community that's supplying food or helping with hospital beds or whatever so we should do that as well but i feel like our voice matters that what we have to give to the world really matter so that's my message like don't stop creating you know keep doing it because it matters yeah thanks so that's, that's, that's an amazing message uh, and an amazing note to end this conversation on uh, thanks so much for taking out the time and thanks for talking to us thank you so much adarsh you're so sweet thank you thanks